Hi y'all, in this video I'll be responding to Super Princess Tea Party's video on toxic masculinity. So, hello. I'll put a link to it below under my PayPal and Patreon information. Smooth plug here. Okay, alright. So I was going to go point by point like I ordinarily do, but I'm going to just talk about some general ideas here. And uh, Super, Pr Super Princess Tea Party, I guess I'll just say Super, Super Princess Tea Party, because it's easier to say than Anyway. Um, you were trying to explain how people are misconceiving what toxic masculinity is aiming to say. This is just part and parcel, I've mentioned this a few times, but this is part and parcel of how the leftists, how the social justice warrior, how the feminist camp operate. Um, it's about narrative crafting. So here you have masculinity, which has positive attributes, you know, courage, strength, independence, these types of things, and uh, they don't like that. So, so what can we do in order to taint this, to corrupt it a little bit, I know, I'll stick the word toxic next to it, and then when people read that, and they take it quite literally for, you know, what it seems to say, you have to come by, or someone else has to come by and explain how, oh, you can't just look at what they've said, you've got to look underneath it and really dig in deep. No, actually, I don't. If there is this problem of they're so uh, frequently being misunderstood, the problem isn't with the audience, it's with the speaker. They need to be more careful in what it is they are claiming. Then there's this other notion that masculinity, or masculinities, that somehow these things are indivisible. Um, I'm sorry, that they're somehow divisible or separable from the human. They aren't. It's like saying, uh, I have a body. I don't have a body. I am my body. I am my mind. I am my mind and body put together. These traits that are commonly associated with men, you know, the masculine traits, aren't just things that, that we can get rid of. Or they are just there. Strength, courage, independence. And what they want to call toxic masculinity isn't toxic masculinity. It is a failure of particular men to actually have a balance of these traits. Some of them will emphasize things to an unhealthy degree. Well, kind of like a min maxing that you would get in video gaming. You know, I just want to be all DPS. You know, I'm a glass cannon. Well, okay. Or I want to be completely heals and then complain that you can't ever kill anything so you can't quest on your own. So you have some guys who will emphasize strength and they will de-emphasize independence or courage or... Uh, some other aspect uh, of this set of traits. The traits aren't separable though. They're always there in some proportion or another. Women have them too. Men just have some of them to a greater extent. The instincts are stronger in us than they are in women. One of one of the big misconceptions is this notion of that, that men are unemotional. It isn't that men are unemotional. It's that men have emotional discipline. These are two different things. I have feelings. I have very strong passions, very strong feelings. I also have a tremendous amount of mental and emotional discipline. These are requirements when you are possessed of very strong emotions. A lapse in your emotional discipline, a lapse in your mental discipline, will lead you to engage in behaviors you would not otherwise do. In other words, it will lead you to fail to, you know, take account of all your particular traits and keep them in check. It, it prevents you from being a, a balanced person. And um, it isn't that men can't cry or men need permission to cry. We don't need anyone's permission to feel what we feel. The issue isn't about whether or not a particular man or men in general feel a given thing or are sad about a given thing or whatever. And it's not even an issue of whether or not they cry. It's, it's one of form selection. Location, location, location. Just because you feel sad at a given moment because some tragedy has happened does not mean that that is an appropriate time to just cry. Uh, go watch the documentary Restrepo, and here you can see uh, infantry guys, you know, the, the, the most masculine among us, I guess. Some of the strong, the warrior, the fighter types. They cry when their friends are killed. What they don't do is cry while their friends are being killed. They cry after the battle is over, not during the battle. The latter is perfectly fine. You've been through something very traumatic, you, know, you deal with your emotions. The former is a pathway to death. You, you watch these, um, well, maybe you don't, but you can watch these documentaries about men who have fought in past wars, and after the years have gone by, they'll say really stupidly romantic things like, and that's when, uh, you know, I pulled out a picture of my wife and family and started looking at it. No, you didn't. Men do not pull out pictures of their family when bullets are coming at them and start staring at it. That's a recipe to be killed either by the opposing force, because, you know, if you're doing this, you're not, you're not suppressing uh, your enemy, you're not fighting your enemy, you're not stopping your enemy, uh, or by your own guys who look at you and go, oh, look, a coward, Pfft. All right, moving on. If you're going to sit there and be entirely useless, take eating up supplies, doing this, and when, when the going gets tough, you want to pull out a picture of your family and hold it like a teddy bear, we'll just kill you and divorce ourselves of this problem entirely. All right, everyone, step over his corpse. March on. We have a war to win. 
without this useless, weak person. Now contrast that with men who are recounting the battles they've been in, and now, you know, years later, they're talking about it, and they still get teary-eyed, and they still cry over the death of their, their uh, comrades. I shouldn't say friends, I should, I should say comrades. Camaraderie and friendship are subtly different. Uh, camaraderie is extremely strong, but very fickle. It's, it is a situation dependent. While you're in the war zone, the camaraderie between a man and his fighting fellows is extraordinarily strong, but it's very short-lived and is very fickle. Once the war is over, these people don't tend to stay in contact. They're not friends. It's not something that's been cultivated on personality and a long, you know, long uh, years of getting to know each other and liking each other. It's the, the exigencies of, of war that create that bond. And it's because you need to have that bond if you are to survive it. Now, you mentioned in a previous video about how women have to think about things that men don't. Men do have to think about these things. And indeed, when you look at crime statistics, almost without variation, uh, there, are, there are some subsets of crime where women are the victims more often than men. If you exclude, like for example, prison rape, um, then you can, you can get that and whatever the prison rape st stat, uh, stats look like, you, it may well be the case that more men are actually the victim of that too, but putting that off to the side. Men are overwhelmingly more often the victim of every category of crime except for like two. Nevertheless, from the perspective of a woman, you still are able to claim, uh, bet betraying your bias here, claim that women have problems to worry about in these regards that men do not. Men have all of the same problems to worry about and more. You were talking about safety. When women think about safety, you said this in a previous video, it's a warm, positive thing for you. Of course it is. Your safety is not, is not dictated largely by your own efforts. Your safety is guaranteed by the, uh, the actions of other men in fighting off predators. Now on to uh, this thing you were talking about, girls in high school hitting their boyfriends and how the boyfriends aren't able to respond because they're supposed to be strong and to be able to take it, and that's toxic masculinity, which earlier you are saying the traits normally associated with being masculine aren't toxic, you know, like strength, courage, and whatnot. But this strength, that's, that's toxic masculinity. No, it isn't. The reason um, that they don't respond to their girls hitting them like that isn't because they're men and it's not supposed to hurt. This is a misconception. I don't know where you get this from. The reason they don't do it is there is no benefit to a man to lay into a woman. And the reason is because other men are going to deal with that particular man. Uh, to give you an idea of an analogy here, other men are going to respond to some, some dude in high school turning to his girlfriend who's been slapping him and poking him and whatnot and just breaking, you know, laying her nose open, breaking her nose, knocking out some teeth and leaving her as a crying, quivering, bloody mess on the floor the same way that any normal adult is going to respond if you walked walking across the street and there was a, a toddler there, and you just walk over and kick the shit out of that toddler right in the face. Even though you're a woman, uh, you are going to get taken down if you do that to a toddler. There is no advantage for the stronger person, the physically stronger person, uh, to behave in that way to a physically weaker person. It is going to redound negatively uh, for you because other strong people are not going to tolerate that kind of conduct. Now, on the notion of strength and... and uh, emotion and courage and all these other things. One of the things, when you look at uh, what people will call machismo or the, you know, like the overly, the, I'm more masculine than everybody else's masculine men, you know, the, the, the guys who walk around jacked the nine, nine ways to Sunday and that's all they ever focus on is hitting the gym and everything else seems to just fall away. Um, in this kind of mixture of traits, they are focusing on one aspect of strength, namely physical strength, muscular strength, which, you know, it, good for you for focusing on that, but um, there are other aspects of strength that are also incumbent upon men, one of which is, as, as I mentioned earlier, emotional strength. Uh, you linked to a video of a guy giving a TED talk or TEDx talk or whatever it was, and he was talking about how when I grew up and wherever he grew up, and this was masculine culture, everything that he said there, you could just as easily remove the word masculine and replace it with the word black and it would have the same nonsensical set of propositions, only you would immediately see what's wrong with that, whereas when it's talking about, or not, not you in particular, but feminists, uh, the social justice warriors would immediately see a problem there that they won't see when you, you swap out black and put man in. Um, this is not how men writ large are raised. Men writ large are raised uh, in, in the way of husbandry, that they have a duty, they have obligation to protect the weak. For example, if I saw someone kicking a toddler, uh, well, I don't have to run over and take them down um, by hand. I would just shoot them from across the street. 
without hesitation, if I see someone kicking a toddler, I will kill them right there, on the spot. No attempt to get them to stop. No, hey, don't do that. No, let me take the four seconds it takes to cross the street to tackle this guy. He is just simply, or girl, uh, that person is simply just going to have a bullet whizzing through them. Period. That is duty. That is obligation. It is something that men are raised with. There are pressures that do... Uh, that, that uh, are put on men to behave in certain ways. And the reason for it is, is that someone has to do these things, and it is not typically, typically going to be a woman who will do these things. There are some women who, uh, who have physical strength to be able to stand up for themselves, uh, against some subset of men at least, and uh, do have the, these kinds of instincts. They are not the ones that predominate. And another thing about the black guy you, were, you brought up, one thing you need to understand about guys, and, and men and women, is that women set the tone for social interaction. If women writ large don't find something to be acceptable, uh, and eventually men are going to cater to that, and some, well, you can look at all the different laws we have to protect women, who we need to have not just one law that says you can't not pay them the same thing as a man for the same work, we need to have two laws. Uh, when women wanted the right to vote, the moment that uh, you know enough women said we want it, within a year, the Constitution of the United States had been amended, the fastest amendment ever to appear in our Constitution. Uh, and just, you know, the moment they wanted it, they got it. So, uh, women are catered to in, in uh, very many ways uh, through society. But they uh, set the tone for social interaction, and so when you see these communities where men treat women in particular ways, and they are still reproductively successful, all you're noticing is that the women there are prepared to tolerate that conduct. And it should not be just like a child who doesn't have, uh, who doesn't have boundaries put on him is going to act however he wants. Or, you know, certain kinds of fish in a tank, they'll grow to the size of the, their environment. You're going to see these, these actions or these behaviors play out in particular ways in some communities that you won't see in other communities. And just before, well, I'm sure I'm already going to be accused of being racist. You could also take out black and masculine and put in poor people culture. A toxic poverty or something like that. This, this is not an aspect of masculinity. These are other, other things. These are aspects of um, boys who aren't raised with women who value themselves sufficiently well to say to the guys, I'm sorry, I will not mate with a person who engages in this conduct. If you started seeing a lot of that happening, you would start seeing a lot of men changing their conduct to accommodate that desire of the women in their local area, and that, that little culture going on there. Because women set the tone for sexual and therefore social interaction. It is a big driver for men uh, for all the obvious reasons. One of the things you need to realize is that we are animals first and foremost. Men and women, humans, are animals. We are not some radically fundamentally different creature than everything else in nature. We have one particular set of skills, namely our brains, that differentiates us from all the other animals, but we still have, uh, you know, through evolu evolutionary history, we were at the same place as a lot of the current species are now millions of years ago, and those things still uh, are in us to include how our brain is designed. But we're all, so we are the creature that, we are the tool making creature. We are the creature that adapts our environment to serve us, to serve our needs and our interests, rather than uh, being reliant on our adapting to the environment all the time. Nevertheless, we're still able to adapt to the environment. There, are, there is a spectrum of social conditions that men can get along just fine in and they will conform their conduct in various ways based on what's expected of them from the people they're interested in impressing. Now, uh, the age-old question of what makes a man, prudence, independence, um, strength, emotional control, not, emo not being unemotional, but, but emotional control, these types of things. In, in short, individualism, uh, and I think it's best put by Ralph Emerson, who said something along the lines of, uh, what I must do is all that concerns me, not what the people think. This task is equally arduous in intellectual and actual life because you will always find people who know what your duty is better than you know it, or at least who claim to. And then he goes on to point out that the great man, it, were, it is easy in solitude uh, to live after our own opinion, and it's easy in the world to live after the world's opinion, but the great man is he who in, in the midst of a crowd can keep with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. It's a good paraphrase, by the way. There are always going to be people who will come by and tell you they know your duty better than you know your duty. Uh, this is typically why people come with parents, to help them along, to help them navigate the world. Uh, and, you know, you need one of each. It's, that's a good thing to have, to help them navigate this, to, to appreciate when they're being deceived, when they're not being deceived, 
what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, these types of things, because we aren't born fully matured adults who just have uh, some intuition about the way the world works in some perfect mirror of the way the world actually works. It takes a lot of training. Uh, back to the Restrepo thing, where guys in combat whose friends have just been killed and who then cry after the combat is over, not during the combat, so the way they and the rest of their friends who are still alive can survive the combat. They eventually learn how to handle that, too. That's still a learning process for them. Um, it's one of perspective. Now, guys have far more uh, pressures on them than women have and than women know about. Men will share their feelings with other men. They don't tend to walk around bemoaning the world in front of women. Anyway, it's one of perspective. When you have seen the types of things like what I have seen, I have no tolerance whatever for people who cry at the drop of a hat. When I was in high school, actually, there was this girl named Renee who would cry at the drop of a hat, and to prove it, <laughs> one of the teachers said, anybody want to see Renee dry, uh, cry at the drop of a hat? And dropped a hat, and she, broke, she burst into tears. Just an emotion, just emotionally fragile nine, uh, nine, nine ways to Sunday. Always, always, always crying about the most trivial, inconsequential things you could ever possibly think about. I look at that with a bit of contempt. No dignity there. No emotional discipline. No maturity. I look at other men who cry over bad things that have happened, uh, particularly when it's not pressing and it's not something like, um, you know, like it's not an ongoing thing, like a mom is dying or a brother is dying or some such, uh, and they've not, uh, no one's dead when it's something that's uh, not like at that level, I tend to look at them and go, you know, you really need to, you really do need to man up. You need to discipline yourself and learn an appropriate form and an appropriate set of tools to be able to confront your emotional issues. Uh, one is when the event is ongoing, you need to be stoic. When the event has passed, you need to find a way to let go of whatever that is. For some people it's exercise, for some people it's sex. Don't become an addict or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not advocating that. But you have got to do both. You've got to be able to have that um, that steelness about you. To, to have just become steel when it's necessary to do it. And then to not be that when it's unnecessary to be that way. And um, one thing you have to realize about guys, as I mentioned, we have feelings too and they're, they're rather strong. Uh, but you also have competing interests, on competing pressures on your behavior and your emotions that women simply don't have. If you want to cry at the drop of a hat, knock yourself out, and go, oh, it's just, you know, she's just crying, give her a minute, that kind of thing. Guys don't have that luxury. Uh, and I hasten here to add, it isn't that guys don't have the right to do that. They're free to do it. You're simply incorrect when you say they should be free to do that and still retain their respect. No, that's not true. A guy who cannot keep it together when it counts is not a guy who is who's worth my respect. I am the only one who gets to decide who is and who is not a worthy object of my respect. And a man who falls apart at a critical time when he should be, you know, when something needs to be done and it's pressing that it be done, has only earned my contempt. Anyway, uh, and I'll sum it up uh, in, in this way with my uh, between my brother and my mother. My mom was very physically abusive. I learned how to take a punch as a kid, you know. 10-year-old, whack! Is that all you got? No. Anyway, uh, well, bef before that, uh, on the high school thing, um, it, it derives from, from, well, I can't say it derives from it, but it's the same aspect of hearing, we don't hit girls. This is a lesson I never learned as a child. Um, <laughs> the, the first nose I ever opened up was that of a little girl who dug her fingernails into my hand. Ordinarily, if there's no particular purpose to engaging in physical conflict, and there's the opportunity for it, I withdraw. I, I don't enjoy violence, though I'm unafraid. It's not cowardice. There's just, if there's nothing to be served by my doing it, other than the petty matter of ego or pride, which are fool's errands anyway, then I, I withdraw. I'm not going to engage in it. If there's some particular purpose of moment that's worth engaging in, in you know, physical conflict, then I will do it. I have no problems doing it. Um, just I tend to try to avoid it. If I'm at a party and it looks like things are going south, I leave. I just don't want any of that around me. But in any event, uh, this did not leave me an avenue of escape because she had her fingernails dug into my hand. So I created an avenue of escape in the form of her nose splitting open. And I get called into the, the office and, you know, we don't hit girls. I'm like, well, we do. <laughs> girls should first learn not to attack boys if they don't want to be hit by boys. It's a very simple proposition. 
if you don't want me to hit you, it's very easy to, uh, to go through your entire life without my ever hitting you, whether you're male or female. Don't lay your hands on me. And if you are going to confront me, leave me an avenue of escape, and I will typically withdraw, unless there's some reason to stay and fight, in which case, uh, you better bring your A game, because one of us uh, will be on the ground in tears, and one of us won't be. And um, I don't cry that easily. Anyway, so the competing pressures of this. One, you, ha you have the strength, and you also have to have the discipline. So you've got to be able to control these different interests. And so my mom, um, after my brother came back from the army, he wanted to go out with some friends or, I don't remember, I think he wanted to go skating, actually. This is a long time ago, back when, back when going to the roller rink, you know, <laughs> that was really cool. Anyway, so he comes back, he's been gone for like, I don't know, a year or some shit. And she was nagging and nagging, doing her normal thing, trying to pick a fight, and, uh, and she succeeded, and so they're, they're bickering, he, and, um, she goes. She slaps him. He doesn't do anything. Uh, but then um, she made a nearly fatal mistake on her part. I have to say, because she grabbed him by the throat, and it's the only time he ever raised a hand to her. And th the event played out so fast. I when I was sitting there the whole time. I barely saw it. As soon as her hand went around his throat, he let out this this uh, sound of exasperation, just this frustration. And then next thing I know, she's screaming for help because he and one move, he's got her in the air, and then he's jumping with her through the door, the front door, taking off, taking it off the hinges, and just chucks her th right over the fucking railing of the porch. And so when I get to the door and look out, she's, you know, plastered in the yard. And then he jumps over, and he, he walks over, and he grabs her, and he says, if you ever do that again, I will kill you. I will just fucking kill you. And he's, he's got tears coming out of his eyes, not because he's sad and boo-hoo. It's just raw anger. My mom learned a very valuable lesson that day. That if you, uh, one, is that you can push a man so far and his normal prudence, his normal temperament, will be able to constrain the aggression that men do have within them, the capacity to do harm that they have within them. But once you start putting his survival instinct up against his respect for not hitting women or these types of things, you are very likely to come out on the losing end. And when a man does snap, and defends himself, and he really wants to put you down, you as a woman stand no chance whatever in resisting that, uh, if he has any strength on him at all. You know, athletic women have about half the strength of a guy. My brother is very athletic, extremely athletic. He's been like a brick shithouse. And, uh, and then he also mentioned, while you're at it, if you ever touch my brother again, I'll kill you too. She never touched him or me again after that. It took one incident where she realized just what a precarious uh, perch she rested on in engaging in these kinds of activities. I wish you'd done it earlier, but whatever. Now, I'm not a violent person. My brother's not a violent person. But e either of us, and we both work <laughs> in law enforcement so <laughs> and military, <laughs> we hate violence so much. What can I do to get a job working where there's lots of violence around? Anyway, uh, but we will both engage in it when necessary. That aggression is there. But a man who fails to discipline that and to constrain it is just ersatz. He's an ersatz man. That's not toxic, toxic masculinity. That is the failure of a particular man to take account of his life, to take, to take stock of his nature and all of his tools, and he is a guy who has abdicated the central feature of being a human. Mental control, mental power. He has abdicated that. And that's one of the reasons why these people are held in such contempt. The, 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 gift, the greatest gift that we as humans have is ratiocination, the power of our mind, and a guy who is unable or unwilling to constrain his raw emotions is acting like a petulant child, and no one, but no one, enjoys a petulant child. All right, I hope that clears up uh, the issue on toxic masculinity. Have a great day.